Channel 31 acknowledges the traditional custodians of the land on which this episode was filmed, the Dja Dja Wurrung peoples, and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. We extend those respects to the Wurundjeri peoples of the Kulin Nation, the land on which the Channel 31 studios are based. I'm Bridie Shepherd, and today on the Eco Show, I'm at Nardu Hills in Northern Victoria, just outside of Echuca. I'm going to be learning about the cultural and ecological significance of this land, and also about the extreme weather events that are happening here. We are out on Jaja Wurrung country today on the Nardu Hills Private Reserve. The reserve is located in central Victoria, just outside of Wedderburn, in the northwest corner of Jaja Wurrung country. This reserve is managed by Bush Heritage Australia, an independent, not for profit, who's working to conserve landscapes and our irreplaceable native species. Nardu Hills is one of the few places left in Victoria where you can still find healthy grassy box and box iron bark species in this woodlands. This is one of the main reasons Bush Heritage bought the property in 2005 and are now working to manage threats to the land and enhance conservation values. This area's largest threat is a changing climate. This means variation in rainfall patterns and temperature and longer, more frequent heat waves. This is catastrophic for trees and they are losing their resilience to deal with extreme temperatures. This is known as tree dieback. I'm on the reserve today with a number of people working to support this land. First up, I'll be chatting with Glenn Norris from Bush Heritage Australia. To address this dieback, Bush Heritage has established a project to provide guidance on climate-ready eucalypt revegetation for the reserve. This region is using a strategy called climate-adjusted provincing. How um, is the ecology affected if you have a lot of dieback of trees? What we will see is when we have so um, in temperate woodlands, um, trees are a really important part of the landscape, mostly um, mixed eucalypt. Um, so there are key, key species to have on the landscape that are really key food and habitat species for our woodland birds that are on decline throughout Victoria. So once we lose these trees and they're, started to, they're removed from the ecosystem, we see what scientists call a negative cascade mm. and things can, can decline quite rapidly. So we really need these trees for our insects, for our insect eating birds, for a whole, a whole range of things. So we want to maintain these species in the landscape um, as much as we can. Mm. So we're going to be learning about some really cool provincing uh, techniques and ways that um, different projects are helping to restore the land. But can you tell me a bit about how you can try and bring some moisture back <laughs> to uh, these trees? Is there any way to sort of restore the, um, the water table? Sure, Bridey. Um, so what Bush Heritage are, are looking to do in other areas and what we've got a real focus on in, in this particular property is I guess to try and rehydrate the, the property in a particular cat, micro catchment where we've, we've, we've just commenced a pilot project. So we're looking at more of an integrated or a holistic restoration project rather than just focusing on weeds or just focusing on feral predators and things like that. So we know the landscape's drying and we know that we're having more severe and frequent heat waves and we know that rainfall patterns aren't as reliable uh, as what they were in the past. So what we're trying to do is to retain moisture in the landscape as much as possible or for longer periods without damming water. We're just looking to retain that so we get more effective rainfall. We get more value out of the rainfall that's fallen. Currently, in a, in a really fantastic season that, like this year, we're getting a lot of runoff and a lot of water actually leaving the property. Some scientists are referring to this as a leaky landscapes yeah. type scenario. So where drainage lines and creeks are essentially acting as drains or functioning as drains. So when we think about uh, a holistic restoration project, we're really looking at restoring some of that functionality from a, from a hydrological or a water perspective, how water moves through the landscape and all the positive cascades that will come out of that from having that level of hydration 
back in the landscape. Yep. Mm. So are you looking to restore um, the ecosystem to pre-colonial times? Is that the ideal? So trying to get the landscape back to pre-European is not a realistic goal. And for a couple of reasons, we're managing the legacies over the last 150 plus years of you know, really intense sheep grazing, really intense rabbit activity. You've all seen photos from the 40s and 50s of, of the rabbit plague and the change in hydrology or the way water drains off the landscape. So in the contemporary context, we're solely looking at the functionality perspective. So the plants and animals that we love, the iconic species of Victoria, have the resilience built in so they can cope with the changing environment. But from a bigger strategy, Bush Heritage are looking to create those biolinks to better add to that resilience so the species can adapt in the face of climate change. Glenn is working to ensure a healthy landscape for increased biodiversity. But what is biodiversity and why is it so important? Bush Heritage Ecologist for Victoria, Julie Radford, is about to take me through this. So biodiversity is the biological diversity of an ecosystem. And it includes all plant and animal life, from the fungi, mycorrhizal fungi in the soil, to all of the microorganisms um, that you see. Now it basically, you know, when you look at an ecosystem, it's important to understand that no one thing is happening out here in isolation. Everything is interconnected and there is a relationship that's happening between species um, to, you know, to provide that ecosystem function. So that's what biodiversity means. It's everything that's happening out here, all plants, all animals, and those relationships that are happening between those things. Each of those things coexist and co-occur together in an ecosystem to create that system. And so if you lose one thing from an ecosystem, you then have that flow on effect where you will lose other things. Now, if we lose our canopy species across Nardu Hills, we will also lose pollinating species. We will lose our insects. We will lose things that are supposed to grow on the ground that require that shade. So we might, it will completely change and alter that ecosystem. So we'll go from having what's a, a lovely grassy woodland ecosystem into more of a grassland system. So it will change the system completely. Mm, so just kind of a knock on effect that could keep yeah. going in unpredictable ways potentially. That's right, that's yeah. exactly right. So everything has a relationship and everything needs to be maintained. So maintaining that functionality within an ecosystem is vital. We have a very fragmented landscape that we work in and so our role is to actually uh, bring all of our community groups and our environmental groups together to make sure that we're all working across that landscape so that we can see some linkages within that remnant vegetation. And that's, you know, Nardu Hills is one step or one, one piece of that puzzle, putting it all back together. Whilst filming the Eco Show, our crew chose to stay at the historic Ravenswood homestead. Before the booming gold rush of the late 1800s, what is now Bendigo City was the sheep station Ravenswood Run, originally covering 118,000 acres. Ravenswood Homestead now operates as boutique accommodation for up to 40 guests and is also a sought-after wedding and event destination. To book your stay at Ravenswood Homestead, head to thegroundsravenswood.com.au. The land we live on has been managed by First Nations peoples for thousands of years. Harley Douglas is a project manager at the Jar Jar Wurrung Enterprise, trading as Jandak. Jandak actually means country, so we're on Jandak right now. So yeah, my role within Jandak is project manager and I manage several projects and sit on a few different project working groups. Um, similar to this project here, I've sort of been invited uh, into Bush Heritage's project to uh, help give that Jajarung cultural perspective, which is so important in a project like this on a bush heritage property. Can you tell me about the land you're on? Uh, so we're on Jajarung country right now, uh, about 266,000 hectares, uh, and we are in uh, just outside of Wedderburn, uh, sort of in the northwest corner of Jajarung country. Jajarung country is quite huge. <laughs> <laughs> it is, yeah. It takes up quite a large uh, section of the gold fields in central Victoria. Yep. It's very evident our people have been in this landscape for thousands of generations, uh, as is seen with the cultural items that they've left behind. What kind of cultural items are uh, still around? 
So we have rock wells, uh, which are wells that have been graved into rocks. Uh, to They're used in times of drought um, to, uh, to have a water source in times where there isn't any water. Uh, where we are currently, there isn't flowing water for most of the year. Uh, so little refuges of water like that were really prized uh, during those times. Um, also have signs of uh, cooking, oven mounds, uh, clay balls as well. Um, we have one of those on this site that we're familiar with. Can you tell me a bit about what kind of work you're doing to manage the environment? Jandak, uh, Jajarung Enterprise, the business arm of Jajarung Clan's Aboriginal Corporation. Bit of a mouthful, that sentence. Um, <laughs> we, we are reconnecting with those traditional land management practices. Uh, we've been undertaking a lot of cultural burning, traditional burning practices uh, across many different landscapes on Jajarung country. Uh, and we've also just been uh, given the keys to six uh, parks uh, under joint management. Uh, with Parks Victoria as the governing agency. So the joint management uh, allows us, Jandak and Jajarung, uh, the community more broadly to reconnect with managing land traditionally. Yeah, that's really remarkable. So you're working with all these um, different organisations as well? That's right, yeah, it's a, it's a partnership approach. Um, obviously we can't do all of this by ourselves and we're going to need a lot of help. Um, and I think it goes both ways as well. The government agencies are in need of help from us at this point. Mm. Um, as we've seen with the bushfire summer that we had last year, um, there's been a real shift towards uh, traditional land management practices, specifically cultural burning. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is a big place for us, uh, Jandak and Jajarung, to play in this contemporary landscape of natural resource management. Harley's project looks at the importance of natural springs and hydrological function of the water in Nadu Hills. Uh, the natural spring within that area, very significant to Jajarung people, um, and natural springs are very significant to Aboriginal people all over Australia because of their importance in such a dry landscape like this. Uh, having water refuges like natural springs uh, that aren't going to evaporate because they're underground for the most part until they discharge, which is where there is a discharge on this property here. Um, in this granitic country, uh, there's a lot of uh, natural springs and soaks that discharge in certain intervals. Um, and like I've mentioned, they are just so culturally significant to our people. Can you tell me about the work that you're doing with the Climate Adjusted Provincing? I'm also sitting on this from a Judge Rung's perspective from things. Uh, so the on-ground implementation and then uh, the social outcomes of things I'm really uh, excited about. The climate ready plants is such an interesting thing, bringing species from other areas into this area to see if they're going to be more tolerant uh, in the, the future warming climate that we're facing. There's some pretty harsh criticism around trialling things like this. Um, and within the Judge Run community, I know there's a few people who are really purists, they don't want to see plants from other areas brought onto their country. Um, and while I respect and understand and consider that, I also understand that the world we know is changing so rapidly. Um, so we should be doing whatever we can to try and make it more resilient in the future. It's almost like offsetting the human influence. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. And what do you think the, uh, the future is going to be like for the Judge Orang in a changing climate on this land? Big question. <laughs> Incredibly yep. uh, complex and almost philosophical question <laughs> there. Um, I think it's going to be positive. Um, I am very young and naive in a certain sense, but I, I look at the world through rose-coloured glasses in a sense that I think the great work that Judge Orang has been doing in the last three years that I've been with the business, we've doubled in size nearly every single year. Um, so if we keep up that trend, I know that we'll have more traditional owners managing landscape, uh, managing country, which is so important for these landscapes, the plants and the animals, and also the social outcomes that that provides, reconnecting Jara people with landscapes and traditional land management practices. It almost is a form of decolonizing um, Australia. We 
have heard a bit about the Climate Ready Revegetation Research Project and the strategy they're using called Climate Adjusted Provincing. Dr Gary MacDonald, a Bush Heritage volunteer and research entomologist, has led the project, supported by Bush Heritage ecologists and scientists. I have found a not so quiet spot to chat with him about it. Hi Gary, we're at the top of a very windy hill. Can you explain what site we're on at the moment? Sure. We're, well, we're, of course, we're at Nardo Hills Reserve. Uh, we're on the western side. We're on a, on a, a range of hilltops um, around which we have done our experimental plantation. So you're working with eucalypts um, to protect them against future extreme hot climate events. What's the current situation facing eucalypts in this area? We've noticed over the last 10 years or so that, that a number of our key eucalypt species in the reserve, and, and of course that reflects the broader landscape in this region, trees are starting to lose their canopies. And that, that began uh, 10 years ago, and we had another big event in 2014 where a whole lot of key trees, what we call mother trees, in, the, in across the reserve were losing their canopies. The, the tops of the trees were drying off, the leaves were, were being dropped off, and, and occasionally we get reshooting from the base of the tree. We, we've seen this across, uh, right across the reserve, in, in, in particular areas of the reserve, um, like the one behind us, but also across the region. And, there, and there's a, a couple of species that most concern us. One is grey box and another is yellow box. There, I mean, there are hundreds of eucalypt species in Australia and even in this region. But, but they are a couple of the, the, the more sort of key species. They're, they're ubiquitous, well they should be ubiquitous, and they represent a really important structural part of our ecological community. So to, to start to see big old trees, beautiful big old uh, grey box and yellow box, give up the ghost, uh, knowing what an important species they are, it, it's distressing. And, it, and it's a sign of things to come, we fear. And what would it look like if there were no yellow or grey boxes in this area? How does that affect the ecology? Yeah, great question. The, the thing is that there are, you know, in a reserve like this, there are certainly many species, but there's a hierarchy. There, there's a, uh, there's, there's, the system is geared around big, big trees and the eucalypts creating a sort of ecological framework for everything else to exist. So they create the shade, they, um, they actually bring up water from deep down and redistribute it on the top of the soil. And, and in doing so, they enable lots of other plant species. But of course, what about the animals? I mean, the, the birds, the reptiles, the bats, the insects that live in these trees and in the surrounding vegetation that these trees support. So you lose these big structural elements to our, to our reserve and the landscape and all those other species have to find another home. In many cases they can't do that because there aren't the, 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 the appropriate trees to do so. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's important. I mean, it's, it's terrible to lose one species, but to lose big, big trees that have such a consequence on other species within the reserve is, is hard to live with. And especially here, so we're in a grassy woodland, is that's that right? That's right, that's right. So there's not too many other big trees or places that animals can sort of seek no. refuge? No, uh, quite right, they're quite right. They're, they're like little, I mean, looking around here, you'll see the, the, the big old mother trees with a few small trees underneath them. They're beacons, they're, they're, they're places where animals, particularly at night I might say, and birds during the day, all go, or actually they come away in the mornings, uh, bats and insects. Uh, you take them out and the diversity of the region, the diversity of the reserve will drop dramatically. A mother tree is a tree that has established very deep root systems so they can access moisture that is well below soil profiles and create shade for their offspring as well as for other plants to survive. So these mother trees are pretty important to this area because they take 50 to 100 years to grow. Gary's project involved identifying areas of Australia that are already experiencing the hotter, drier climate that Nardu Hills will face in the next 90 years. 
Thousands of seeds were then collected from grey box and yellow box trees in different locations across southeastern Australia, where the climate is similar to that predicted in the northern Victoria region. Most importantly, in 10, 15 or 20 years time, when we start to see these, these trees, these new trees, flower and cross-pollinate, we are able, we we're looking forward to those producing the next generation of trees. And it's that mixing of genes between local trees or local provenance and those other provenances. And we don't know what, we just, we have no idea what, what genes they might be bringing together. But there'll be some that will do much better in emerging climates than others. And nature will just take its course then. Nature will select the trees that are best adapted. Um, and it'll be a, it'll be a, 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 a it'll be a, a shifting tide of climates. We might have 10, 15 years of cold, wet climates, and then some, you know, five years of really hot, tense climates. And so that will selectively pull out and advantage some progeny. And so maybe in 30 years time, we'll have some much stronger trees in the landscape. And hopefully they'll have a much broader gene pool. Now, I, I, the gene pool is really just a, an expression that describes all the variations, all the possible variations on, on the different trays that a tree might use to protect itself from the hot, dry climates. So that's what we're hoping. At the moment, the gene pool for the local provenances might be fairly narrow. We're widening that gene pool right up by introducing uh, genetic variation from all these different areas. That's the hope. We're just hoping we just need a couple of decent years for these trees to get their roots right down there and we're off and running and uh, we're looking forward you know this 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 experiment is designed to encourage collaborators other universities CSIRO um, to come on board and, and and look at very specific elements of the trial it's designed in a way that other researchers might feel uh, really lends itself to doing additional research so we're hoping through collaboration, we're hoping to get a whole lot of knowledge that uh, has yet to be gained. I mean, this is one of the first trials of this nature in Australia. So we've really got to make the best of it and do everything we can to ensure that we've got uh, a trial that will last a, a long time. Over the coming decades, the survival rate of these introduced seedlings will be tracked and it's hoped they will cross-pollinate with local trees to produce a genetically diverse woodland, better able to weather harsh conditions. Today has been a really fascinating day. I've been talking to Jandak and Bush Heritage Australia about not only the history of this landscape, but also the ways that they're changing and evolving in the future. I can't wait to see how climate adjusting provincing goes and how it continues to grow. Thank you.